Hey everyone, I uh, figured I'll start a minute longer. I have one more minute, yes. So um, every now and again, somebody sends me a message on Messenger or wherever, and the message kind of goes along, how do I debug Geth? And I always I have a follow-up question, what do you mean debug Geth? Just submit an issue. And it turns out that they actually don't have an issue. Rather, they, are, they want to know how they can know if Geth is actually working, or if Geth is working properly, or how healthy it is. And then usually what we refer people to is, well, just look at the logs. How hard can that be? OK, I'm being a bit ironic here. But uh, the problem with looking at the logs is that we either arrive in this situation where Geth is just silent and there are no logs, and you're just waiting and waiting. Or maybe there's a log every 15 seconds, but you still have no idea whether that's good or bad. Or we have the more ingenious people who raise the log level, and they still have no idea what's going on. So the problem is that logs are really, really useful if you know specifically something that you're looking for. But if you just want to get a general overview of what your node is doing, then logs are perfectly not useful. <laughs> So what can we do instead? Well, first things first, um, people mostly are interested in whether their node is working or not. And this is not such a simple question to answer because it's never binary. Of course, if the node is not working, we see it, that it is not working. But if it's working, then that's an entire spectrum. It might be working very well. It might be working just barely. But it's still working. Now, the issue is that if it's working very well, then everything is fine. If it's just working barely, then you might have an issue at 3 a.m. in the morning. And you want to be able to tell how healthy is your node. Now, if, let's suppose that we start with uh, latest release. It kind of works. But a lot of, influ a lot of um, things can actually influence uh, your node in some one direction or the other. For example, every time we do a bug fix release, hopefully it improves the situation. And of course, if you run it on more powerful hardware, that also papers over any issues that we might have with flaky algorithms or suboptimal things. Network connectivity and other externalities like workload, again, influence your, oper op your operationality, or however that's pronounced, sorry. <laughs> Essentially, of course, if you, put, if you run a girly node on your notebook, then it will run, perf perform really, really well. Whereas if you run mainnet, then you might run into troubles. These are kind of natural. Now, the thing is, when you start running a production infrastructure, then just knowing that your node works is not really enough. You want to know how well it works, because it's kind of a game of, of trade-offs. If you are, yes, you can put the most powerful virtual machine available on Amazon underneath it, and it will probably run perfectly, but it will cost you a lot. Or you can put a Raspberry Pi underneath it, and it won't run. So let's, how do we found the, find the middle ground? And the answer is actually metrics and monitoring. Now, from the very, very abstract perspective, metrics and monitoring means measure everything that you can and visualize it. And this is not something new in the Ethereum ecosystem. I mean, the stats page was available since forever, and everybody knows its usefulness. However, when you want to measure something more, it's really hard to figure out, OK, what exactly do you measure? I mean, a software system, there are gazillions of things that it does. So what is important and what is not important? And to answer that, you actually need to have specific questions. What kind of questions would you like the answer to? And for example, us in the Geth team, we usually have three questions. One of them is, how do the nodes behave across the globe? The second is that if some node looks weird, then what is it doing, actually? And last but not least, if we found an anomaly and we fixed it, then it is really important for us to see that, OK, the old version did something weird. Does the new version fix it? Yes. And does the new version? really not ruin anything else, yes or no? So if we dive into actual things, actual examples, uh, the Geth team is kind of running eight boot nodes globally across various continents. Now, first question that we want to answer is, are these boot nodes healthy? And how, what is the cost? Now, whether the boot nodes are healthy or not, for us it's really simple. Are they, are they in sync with the network or not? So we simply just visualize how many blocks behind there are from the chain head. And immediately, if it, some boot node falls behind that, we know that something is wrong. But this just gives us the binary thing. We know that it's healthy or not, but we don't know what's the cost or how healthy it is. Now, if we 
if in order to find out actually how healthy it is, we actually need to also chart out the resource consumption of it. And as a computing system, you have four major resources, CPU, memory, disk, and network. And of course, you can split disk up a bit and network up a bit in input, output, etc. But all in all, if we uh, chart all of our eight boot nodes across these four metrics types, then immediately we can see anomalies. For example, on the memory chart, we can see that the yellow boot node is actually using two gigabyte more memory than the rest, or CPU-wise, a similar thing. And immediately you have something to take care of. And the, the other interesting aspect of it is that if you know your nodes have 13 gigabyte, oh, sorry, 32 gigabytes of memory and you're at eight, then you don't care about it. You're really far away from crashing. However, once you start reaching your limits, that's when things will start going wrong. So you can, just looking at this dashboard, you can immediately see how close you are to failure. Cool. Now, just to dive into one of these examples, uh, DevOps team a couple of weeks ago told us that, hey, you're kind of using too much bandwidth. I mean, it costs too much. They care about the money, not the bandwidth. And uh, so we looked at our charts, and yes, indeed, the boot nodes are actually pushing out five, six megabytes per second of data. And we are wondering, okay, what does the boot node do? I mean, this chart tells us how much it costs, uh, resource-wise, but we don't know what it's actually doing with those resources. So those are actually our intermediate level monitoring questions. Let's try to figure out what an Ethereum node is doing with its disk resources or other resources. Now, in case of networking, what can we do? Well, first step, uh, we have um, previously we've measured the total bandwidth a lot, uh, usage, but we would like to also measure the individual map bandwidth usage of individual protocols. Since the boot nodes are running Ethereum and Light Client protocols, those two are the ones we want to run. But we can go even further down and actually measure the network usage of each individual network packet, I mean packet type within those protocols. And if you chart these, we get these really nice fancy spikes, and immediately we have three things that are really, really obviously strange. For example, in the top two charts, those are the input and upload and download speeds of the Ethereum protocol, and you can immediately see that the light blue thingy is causing quite a lot of traffic. And I'm not sure whether it's visible or not, but uh, I will tell you, the white blue has the label of transaction propagation. So just by looking at these charts, you can immediately see that there's something wrong with transaction propagation. <laughs> is taking about 1.1 megabyte per second traffic. And uh, maybe this is enough for you, maybe it is not enough for you to decide what's the next step. But in our case, yes, we are kind of aware of how the transaction propagation works. And this means that we actually need to roll out a new Ethereum sub protocol, or I mean a new version of the Ethereum protocol with an alternative way to propagate transactions because otherwise there's no way to get this down. But we immediately know what the fault is and we, have an idea of how to fix it. Now, the other anomalies from these charts are that the boot nodes are uploading a significant amount of data. And our guess, again, is that since these are the boot nodes, uh, everybody's trying to synchronize from them. So if you want to stop people from synchronizing them, well, of course, we can nuke the boot nodes halfway offline so that they refuse to give you the data, but that's not nice. Alternatively, we need a, a, maybe a better discovery protocol so that you can find peers faster, better peers, etc. <laughs> Again, just, we just looked at uh, what the node is consuming its network bandwidth on, and we can immediately make really nice guesses. Now, there are four resource families, so I, we can do a similar exercise for CPU usage. Now, CPU usage, if uh, somebody were to ask you, what does uh, an Ethereum node use CPU for? The no-brainer answer is block processing. And this was our false assumption for many years, too. And about uh, maybe half a year ago, somewhere around January, we decided that, okay, something's not right, so let's try to split that block processing up. So we saw that, okay, block processing takes 100 milliseconds, but what's inside that? And actually we figured that, well, when you run the transaction, you, there is execution components. We also load the data from disk and we also write it to disk. So let's, and we also do some hashing. So let's try to actually break it up and meter all these components individually. And then the resulting chart was a bit, uh, I don't know, a bit uh, surprising. It turns out that if you run a full node, uh, transaction execution, I mean actually CPU running and computing stuff, that's 25% max. 
of the block processing. So 75% of block processing is shuffling data around. And this is an extremely important thing to know because all of a sudden you realize that optimizing the EVM is not that important. So optimizing the database makes a lot more sense than, than even caring about how much one on opcode costs or the other. And in the case of the boot nodes, this gets even worse. Since everybody is constantly hammering us with requests, in the case of boot nodes, the EVM actual execution is 10% of the block processing time. So that's, uh, that's kind of scary. But again, we have a brilliant idea of where we can optimize. So just a single chart, just some information, we can immediately see how to proceed. Now, other interesting facts that these charts uh, allowed us to see is that uh, transaction validation or propagation, I mean, the Ethereum network's throughput is, I don't know, something like 20 transactions. So you would expect that shuffling 20 transactions per second around is no big deal, except when you chart it out and turns out that the boot node is receiving 11,000 transactions per second. Most of them are duplicates, Half of them are invalid, half of them are, or some portion, big portion of them are underpriced that are, get rejected, but it's really strange. And when you look at that number, you all of a sudden realize that, wait, so the transaction pool needs to be really optimized for this throughput. So it's not the throughput of the blockchain, rather the throughput of the junk data that's coming in, that's uh, defining how much uh, processing we're going to do. And of course, we have two more other big consumers for the CPU. One of them are RPC calls, and, uh, which we didn't chart yet. So that's something that we want to do in the future. And network handshake requests, which uh, might seem like, why does that even take CPU? Well, if you run it on Raspberry Pi, it will murder one core from your Raspberry Pi, just doing the cryptographic handshakes in the network. So again, we need a new discovery protocol to fix it. And the big uh, third one, third category is disk. Now, in the case of disk, it is extremely hard to measure because kind of when you run a program, you have all these layers on top of one another, operating systems, containers, libraries, and they all like to be smart and all like to cache. And this kind of means that there's really hard to measure the thing that you actually want to measure. We could measure how much data we're pushing to disk, but that depends on how much RAM the operating system has and how aggressively it caches. We could check how much, uh, we could ask the operating system to tell it to us, but that also depends on if you run it in Docker, Docker also starts screwing around with all kinds of uh, caches. Now if you, well, after we figured out that we cannot reliably measure, we decided, okay, screw it, we're going to measure how much data we are pushing into the database. Well, it turns out that that's completely useless too, because LevelDB has all these background processes around compactions and fancy storage models. So in the end, we actually needed to patch LevelDB and ship all our metrics into LevelDB so that we can get an accurate uh, measurement. And we're actually really happy for the author of GoLevelDB for allowing, him, uh, allowing us to keep patching his database. So uh, this one I will probably not go into, but the idea is that after you found an actual issue, so after you found that specific metric that is really out of place, then you need to find out why it is out of space, out of place. Here I gave you some ideas, so those are good ideas are, and are enough, but if you don't know, if you, can, if you don't have any ideas, then the only thing you can do is actually to just try to look into the details of the algorithms internally, and try to map out what the algorithms are doing, and, um, and try to have better guesses. And for example, this is maybe one third of the light servers uh, charts that Gary put together. And there are lots and lots of these, just to figure out individual tiny bugs. But I won't go into these because that's completely out of scope here. However, let's suppose we did manage to find what, uh, or we did man we have an idea of what, uh, what, the anomaly, what was the cause of the anomaly, and we have a pull request to fix it. So the next thing is we just open a pull request, merge it in, and everything is fixed. Yeah, no, wrong. The issue is that there are simply so many moving components in Ethereum node that the fact that we fixed one thing might actually break others. So the lifetime of these performance or these anomaly fixing pull requests kind of look like people open a PR, and then we actually run a one week long benchmark to see what does it do. Now, this is the perfect case. We see something like this maybe once a year. These are the miracles of uh, development. When uh, this was actually a pull request created by Gary, 
disabling some internal data shuffling within LevelDB. And what it, the, here, actually, the green lines were the master, and the yellow lines were Gary's experimental PR. Essentially, by just swapping a few variables, he actually managed to cut down the disk I.O. by an order of magnitude. So that was, uh, I mean, you don't get these kinds of charts at all. These are just, you don't, simply don't believe them when everything is perfectly better than previously. What you get a lot more often, however, is these kinds of charts. This was from a previous monitoring system that we had, where somebody opened a pull request that on Windows, Windows really chokes on folders that have many files in them. So let's change level DB to use larger files. I, I mean, it seems like a pretty good idea. Why would you use two megabyte files if you, have, if you can use 100 megabyte files? So he implemented the PR, submitted it, and actually also submitted benchmark results that yes, the number of files go down, the number of used file descriptors go down, the PR got two reviews, everybody approved it, almost got merged in. And then we said, that, yeah, okay, do you know what, let's benchmark this because it's touching scary stuff. And then you go, you start to look at the middle benchmarks and you realize that the disk writes simply exploded. So it, it, it blew up by two orders of magnitude. And again, it was a perfectly good PR, just it didn't take into consideration some weird internal thing of level DB. And these are the PRs that can really, really bite your performance, where everything that you do is perfectly logical, except the result. <laughs> and of course, uh, these are still a good case, because this PR you can at least close. And then you get the really nasty ones, and these are generally, this is the case that we see every time. When, um, so the charts that you see here, uh, that peak, that blue peak, that's actually the Shanghai DOS attack. So it, I just closed in on when we were processing, doing a full sync and processing the Shanghai denial of service attacks, and that's the memory usage. So previously, that's the 1.8 release family of Geth. Every time you reach the Shanghai attacks, we had this huge peak, huge memory peak. Simply, we had various caches in, they used a lot of memory. You essentially, your machine needed 13 gigs of RAM to be able to process those blocks. And of course, that's a lot. So we decided to replace that 13 gigs of, I mean, that caching algorithm with something completely different. And yay, it was a complete success. It completely wiped out the, the peak. And also, even the general data usage, uh, sorry, general memory usage of Geth went down. Except the disk usage went up by 30%. And now you have this huge problem and question what do you do? I mean, 30% extra disk IO is horrible. 10 extra gigabytes of memory usage is equally horrible. And then you, you need, so need to make trade-offs. You need to make really hard decisions that which is better. And then in the end, we went with the extra memory usage is better simply because if you, use a lot of, if you use, want to use more memory than available, you crash. I mean, it's a hard failure. Whereas if you use more disk than you would like, then things get slower, but they still function. So in the end, this is why the actually the 190 release uses more disk than the 18 whatever the last one but all in all we think it was worth it however since gary fixed it now we're much better so <laughs> so th this thing was fixed already cool now th that is kind of how the geth team pushes out these uh, uh, how we monitor stuff benchmark prs and push them out now if you would like to repeat a similar thing in your infrastructure you kind of need to decide how you want to monitor things. You either pay for monitoring as a service via Datadog. We did that for two years, but Datadog essentially had limitations. It didn't allow us to push all the metrics that we had in. So in the end, we switched to our own node. We just ran Grafana. And if you actually decide to run your own on-premise instances, then you need to decide also on a database to push your data in. Either you go with Prometheus or InfluxDB. This, uh, these are kind of whatever you prefer. The reason I explicitly mentioned them is that monitoring infrastructure boils down to these four things. So you don't care about anything else in the world. And from our part, Geth can actually push data either, it can, we can export data into the Datadog format, we can push data into Grafana and Prometheus too. So whatever rocks your boat, we can do it. And just, uh, just for the sake of completeness, I also linked in our own dashboards. So we exported them. We use Grafana and InfluxDB, but uh, you are welcome to use them, integrate them, 
do whatever you want with them. So all our configurations are published there. They will probably also land in our repo eventually. Cool. Now, what are kind of the lessons that we learned while creating these charts? They were that you must measure as low as you can, meaning that every abstraction is transforms your data. Everybody tries to be smart, and those usually ruin your metrics. Now, you always must measure your worst case numbers. I get it that the operating system is really smart and makes things more optimal for you, but if you assume that you run out of memory, then your worst case numbers will, do, will be the ones actually hitting you. So be, always be aware of what's the worst that can happen. And measure everything that can, you can afford. As I shown you previously, you can gain a lot of information with, if you have a lots of tiny detailed metrics, but uh, eventually it will become too expensive. For example, Martin did a really awesome me measurements where he actually measured the cost of each individual opcode. It's really insightful, but obviously you cannot run it in live production environment. Still, if you have the numbers, you can debug an issue. If you don't have the numbers, you will get gather the numbers the next time you reproduce that issue. So there's no way to fix it without numbers. Yeah, and that's about it. Thank you very much.